Hello. Um, so I work, as, as Naresh mentioned, I work at this organization called MIRI. Um, we do research into AI safety and what that would even mean. Um, a lot of our focus is on generally trying to figure out ways that as we build smarter and smarter systems that we somehow wind up in the upper end of the distribution of the ways that this can go. Um, it's a pretty broad mandate. But in general, you want, um, you don't really want to have the moment that you start thinking about safety for these sorts of things to be like after you've created the problem. Uh, you don't want to be kind of in the, um, the situation with, you know, Mickey enchanting the broom to turn around and fill the well in Fantasia or whatever in the, in the Sorcerer's Apprentice skit, and then having to figure out um, after you've created the problem how to you know, put the genie back in the box or in the bottle. Um, and in the sort of pursuit of that, um, we publish a bunch of academic papers on ways to um, like enable agents to cooperate once they cross a certain complexity threshold or um, to like just figure out what it even means to talk about what, you know, if I give you a very, very long uh, number and I ask you, like, as a Bayesian, is that, a pr like, what's the probability that that's prime? You should be able to answer, like, with instant confidence, zero or, you know, zero or one. There's no intermediate probability. It's, it's true or it's false. But, like, as an agent that actually has to reason and takes time to, to work through your, your thoughts, there's a whole process there that is sort of swept under the rug with sort of naive Bayesian reasoning. So um, uh, Nate Soares, who's our executive director right there, that is actually his handwriting. It really offends me how clean his writing is. Um, anyways, uh, <laughs> uh, so we, to, to this end, we run, little, we run workshops where we invite folks out to the Bay Area and try and introduce them to topics in the AI safety space, get them interested in working on this. Um, because at this point in time, you have something like 300,000 people meaningfully working on advancing capabilities in AI. And I would say something like 50 people meaningfully working on safety, and I didn't miss a decimal place. Um, and so maybe that seems a disproportional response. So a lot of my stuff these days is written um, sitting on Twitch. So if you look on Twitch TV for my name, you'll find many, many eight hour long programming sessions of me just sitting there live coding a lot of the kind of stuff that we're going to talk about today. So, with random horrible pa uh, paper sketches and me sitting there trying to explain the complexity in this case, I think of dancing links. Um, but I would, I would personally be much happier with the idea of like that AI safety is a tractable problem if, like, if we flash all the way back to like the the seventies and eighties and we went to like a Marvin Minsky style research program of pushing around a bunch of symbols in some kind of Lisp like thing, if that had worked, right? If that had been the thing that got us like all of our crazy, you know, uh, agents inspecting cat pictures and, you know, abilities to fit 3D models to stuff, um, I would have a much greater level of confidence in how to, um, that we could actually reason about the behavior of these systems. So that's sort of where I'm at right now is trying to figure out ways that I could make functional programming, logic programming, formal methods, et cetera, scale enough to be part of the solution. Okay? So um, everything that I, like my personal research agenda is a sort of contingent research agenda. Hey, look, you'll be able to figure out how to specify these goals in ways that don't go wrong. Um, but like, if you could, like, there's this um, notion that some of you who've like, uh, grabbed me in the hallway and I've, I've talked about, um, which is something like, there's this idea of something called Goodhart's Law. Goodhart's Law is this idea that you get what you measure. Like, if you have a metric that turns out to be correlated with what you're looking for, but isn't what you're looking for, and then you start using that metric to judge people, like you measure programmers by lines of code, because it happened to be correlated with productivity for a while, then once you start measuring on that metric, you cease to get productivity out of lines of code, right? You get Java. Um, <laughs> and so if you look at AI 
and agents in this space. You have this sort of, um, the things that we can measure as a utility function are proxies for what we actually want. Like we want, like this is the thing that I know how to write down that's nice, nice and concise and is cleanly mathematical, right? But it doesn't take into account all the like messy externalities and stuff like that that we should also consider. So the fact that Goodhart's law uh, kicks in is basically saying that almost all AI, once you get past like a certain complexity threshold, like, and it gets very good at zooming in on exactly what you've asked for, is going to start optimizing in that same sort of way, like excessively towards this target that is what you can ask for, which is a proxy for what you want. And you hope that the dot product with like the direction you want it to go is, is sufficiently positive. So I'm not the only person with a language focus in this space. Um, Dimitrios is also uh, running around, I think he took a job recently at DeepMind. He um, published a paper with a guy named Alexei Radul, whose name will come up later on in this talk, um, and a couple of other folks, uh, including the one of the guys who started PyTorch on this programming language project called DEX fairly recently. Um, and their focus is on like big array-based calculations in a Haskell-like language. So they add like these dimension types so they can sit there and talk about like how do I run these big batch processes over tensor-like data sets and produce LLVM-like things. So they care about scaling in that direction. And if I've given talks in the past about how to do SIMD evaluation of like Haskell-style code um, as ways for me to also try and make functional programming scale um, because we've scaled down to like the core level but we haven't really scaled down to use your SIMD unit and your CPU. We haven't scaled out to your GPUs and your TPUs very effectively. And so a lot of my, my research interest is how do I, like if there's a compute bound that is kind of keeping functional programming from being relevant in this space, how do I crush that? If there's a complexity bound in terms of like our ecosystem, there's a bunch of decisions that were made as part of like the design of Haskell back in the 80s and 90s that really have uh, maybe put a sort of artificial complexity cap on the kinds of thoughts we can think in, the, in this language um, or in the way our package management ecosystem builds on top of itself. So there's, there's a bunch of directions when I say I want functional programming to scale when, when I imply that. Okay, so now we can actually get to what this Guanxi thing is in this, this current little sub goal. So one of the other components that I have is trying to make proof effort scale. I would like to be able to um, produce um, code with more than one or two people working on large bodies of formal method-like code. And in this space, there is, um, it's not really focused on proof, but it's a system I'm going to try and repurpose a bit, or the ideas of a system I'm going to try and repurpose. So there's this logic programming framework in Scheme called Mini Canren. So Canren is, um, Let's see if I can describe Kenren. So if you, how many people here know what prologue is? Okay, good. So Kenren is basically like a prologue written as a little embedded domain specific language, a library in Scheme. Okay, I'm not interested in writing Scheme per se, um, but so Dan Friedman, who is the, the, guy, the gentleman in the hat on the left there, um, has written a bunch of these books like The Little Schemer, The Reasoned Schemer, The Little Typer, um, they're rather popular, actually. I think his little schemer, or the, the little lisper, is like the computer science textbook that's been in longest continuous publication or something like that, and has some ridiculous number of random students who've read the thing. Um, and Will Bird, who's the gentleman sitting next to him, was his student and now uh, you know, co-author on a lot of the stuff for working with logic programming. Um, so. They have been building the system called Mini Canren or Canren for a while, but their goals are not my goals. In a, lot, in a lot of ways, like if you can look at Dan's work as sort of trying to make sure that everything he builds can be taught, like at a very elementary, very introductory level, um, to anybody who can like parse through the source code, right? And like it's, it's very much designed so that almost everything he builds can be taught kind of at the 15 year old level. And it's great, it's like incredibly accessible. Um, those of you who know my work might realize that this is not my particular aesthetic. 
Um, I, on the other hand, am willing to throw everything that I know about math and computer science and everything at trying to make my system scale. Okay, so what I'm interested in doing is taking something like a Canron style foundation and throwing everything that I know about SMT solvers and SAT solving and all of these other like domain specific optimizations and like the stuff about propagators that I'll talk about tomorrow um, and I'll talk a bit about today. Um, at trying to make logic programming scale. Okay, so as a bit of an introduction to terminology here, so Kenren, uh, which I'm butchering the pronunciation of, and I will butcher the pronunciations of all foreign words throughout this entire talk, I apologize. So Kenren is like the Japanese word for relation or linking, okay? And um, so it was named, I believe, because Oleg Kisalyov was learning Japanese at the time, you know, he's now, I think, teaching in Kyoto or something like that, so it worked out for him. Uh, uh, last year, I spent a bunch of time learning Mandarin, or starting to, and um, I was looking around for a name for a logic programming framework of my own. And so the word in Mandarin for this sort of relationship-like thing with a slightly different focus is guanxi. So guanxi has different connotations than the very simple word kenren in Japanese. In, in, in Chinese, it's like the network of relationships that you have to pay attention to to get anything done in business and all this other. You know, if you pull on guanxi to like ask for a favor and give face and do all this kind of stuff. Um, so as a dig at kenren, the name guanxi is sort of, hey look, they're not paying attention to all these other externalities. As a dig at myself, um, it's also kind of viewed from Western eyes as the source of like what Westerners would consider corruption in, in, in you know, uh, in trying to deal with China and like why you can't get a foot in the door trying to do business in, in China. You just don't have any guanxi to pull on, right? And so this like this over complex core will probably corrupt my answers. So that's my, my dig at myself. Um, so why do I care about Ken Ren? The system that I'm kind of um, looking to explore is this thing called Barleman. And Barleman exploits the idea that what Will was able to do was build a scheme interpreter. So he wrote an entire scheme interpreter as a logic program in Kenren. And with scheme as a logic pro uh, a scheme interpreter as a logic program, it's a relation. So one of the things you can do with Prolog is if I give you like like the, I want to give you the result of appending x's to y's, I can run that program backwards and compute all of the lists that I could have possibly appended to get this output, right? So you can use functions as relations in something like prolog. So here, having a scheme interpreter as a relation means that what I can do is I can say, hey look, I have a program and it's just a hole. I don't know what it's going to be. But here's some unit tests I would like it to pass. I would like to do test-driven development in a way that matters. So in about nine seconds, it was able to say, from these three examples, let's synthesize the recursive definition of list concat. Okay? Which is magic to me. And they're doing this in Scheme, where they don't have any freaking types. <laughs> um, I think they run into some problems if they go to do, like, reverse. Like, let's be honest. Like, there's some problems here, right? But th what they consider a problem is that it takes more than a couple of minutes. And if you give me um, like helper functions here, like we're, uh, it might be a little bit difficult to see, and I apologize. Um, here, like I'm giving it the definition of reduce write, which is like a fold R. So if I give you fold R and I ask you to define list concat, and I expect list concat to be a something a lambda that takes two arguments, and then ask you to fill in the hole, it will use the helper function because it writes for shorter programs. So if I give you programs I would like to synthesize, little problems, goals that I would like to address, and they're short enough then something like this approach could be used for program synthesis to rather drastically accelerate the developer workflow. And so this is where my interest comes in. Now I'm not interested in synthesizing scheme programs. I'm interested in synthesizing like Haskell programs or dependently typed programs or things with crazily complicated type systems, okay? And it turns out that the more interesting the type system, the more programs I can throw away earlier in this process. So um, 
as a bit of terminology, why the heck is this thing called Barlamin? Uh, so Barlamin is, let's take that scheme interpreter and put this little GUI, this UI thing. And it's based on, I, I think there's a character named Barlamin Butterbur in Lord of the Rings, or I don't remember if it was in, yeah, so he thinks less than he talks and slower, but he can see through a brick wall in time, right? So he's dumb as a post, but he gets the job done eventually, right? <laughs> Um, so that's the, the, at least the name where Barlamin comes from, if you, ever, if you want to look it up. Um, and so Will Bird has some talks you can find on the internet. But I'm sort of interested, like I said, I'm interested in pushing this idea further. So right after Will presented the first example of a scheme interpreter written as a relationship in Kenren, or mini Kenren, um, Gershom Bazerman, who's the gentleman up there on the upper left, had just given a talk, or he had just given a talk on doing dependent type checking in Scheme. He wrote a little dependent type checker and like taught it at Lisp NYC. Okay? So he had this dependent type checker written in Scheme. But we have this ability to run Scheme programs that have holes in them now. So what I would like to do is take this dependent type checker, put little holes in, it, in my problem, and see if I can use it for type inference. Like, if I put holes in the types, can I use it for type inference? If I put holes in the terms, can I use this for program synthesis? And the answer turned out to be yes. It turned out to be rather glacially slow. But, like, the fact that this worked out of the box, like, 10 minutes after the talk, really, like, woke me up and made me think about this a lot. Okay, so that, that's, that's where Gershom kind of comes into this story. Um, I'm not interested in synthesizing scheme programs, but, like, if I start with, like, a Hindley-Milner or a Haskell-like type system, what I can do is I can let the types throw away any syntax tree that could not possibly complete to a well-typed well term. Or where I can like have partial types and partial terms and have them throw away. So like if you're searching through a space of 2 to the 120th programs, it helps to be able to throw away 2 to the 70th, 2 to the 80th of them at every turn. So having the Hindley-Milner style types helps a lot. How many people here are familiar with the idea of liquid Haskell? Has this come across? Okay, a, a smattering of folks. So liquid Haskell is this idea that what you want to, um, what they did was they said, let, let's take Haskell code and put little side conditions, like what's the weakest precondition for this function, or what's the pre precondition for this function, what's the post condition it'll satisfy. And then they like write these extra predicates down in Haskell, basically. And they feed them off to Z3, like this SMT solver, to solve. Okay. So Nadia Pol Polakarpova, who's working on a project called Synquid, uses these liquid Haskell types, these little side condition, pre and post conditions for functions, and uses them to help guide the process of searching. So you've got Hindley-Milner style types, like Haskell style, you know, the for all, like the nice polymorphism and type inference works and everybody's happy. Um, and then you also have these more interesting, and I have predicates. You know, I'm going to I'm going to give you a integer that's greater than or equal to five, and I'm or I'm going to give you a list that is sorted at the, as a result, or something like that. I, I can write down my conditions, and this list will, list will be a permutation of the input list. Um, so Nadia's work is on using liquid types to help guide program synthesis. And she also uses Z3 as sort of her only tactic. Um, finally, down here I have um, this guy, Edwin Brady, um, he wrote this little language called Idris. There's a book on, on uh, programming with Idris that's like been making the rounds for a little while here. Um, Idris is another dependent type checker. Um, its focus is mostly on programming with dependent types rather than um, trying to be a theorem prover. It can be a theorem prover, but it's mostly a programming language that happens to have dependent types. And he's been doing work lately on what he calls like Idris 2 or Blodwin. This is kind of a working name for this thing. And while he's been working on Blodwin, um, he's been trying to incorporate something we call quantified type theory, which is an idea from Connor McBride, where what you can do is when I give you a variable, I can tell you how many times you're allowed to use the variable in the program. Right? So I can tell you like 0 or 1, or you know, like you're going to use this variable exactly once. So you can use linear types if, if, the, if that term has, has crossed any of your ears um, to help restrict the space of possible programs, right? So the idea is you use linear types when possible, and then you can rule out classes of, of effects, of, of failures. Like, you can't accidentally forget to close a file because you have to do something with the resource. You have to use it exactly once. And so you thread it through 
opening the file then creates this chain of reasoning of like, I'm gonna pass the file handle through all the code that I wanna run and then it runs to the close. And a program that doesn't properly close its resources is just ill-typed. Um, so that's the kind of thing that linear types or quantified type theory gives you. So what, why do I care about this? Well, again, I'm trying to, th I'm working through, I'm searching through these huge problem spaces. And something like Idris, usually you sit there and you hit you, some wrist breaking set of macros to try and figure out how to synthesize. Please case match on this term, please do this. And you, you sort of are your own tactic engine in a, in a dependent type checking kind of setting. But, um, like let's say you wanted to compute like the transpose of a matrix. You have a vector of n, a vector of m a's, you know, like, and you want to turn that into a vector of m, a vector of n a's. If you just ask to the, like, Idris or something like that to just synthesize a program, what it'll probably do is it'll figure out how to like get a, like a vector of n and then it'll just repeat it as a smear over the thing, because it's the shortest program. Like synthesizing the next um, column in the transpose is actually needlessly complicated when you already have a, a row that has the right, a column that has the right shape. So, um, but it turns out if you can put like a linear constraint that you have to use every element in the matrix exactly once, turns out the shortest program will probably be the transpose. So if I want to underspecify my constraints and be able to very quickly punctually get a program that does useful work, having these quantified types, having these refinement types, having Hindley Milner style types, lets me throw away larger spaces of programs earlier in the process. So what I'm interested in doing is trying to take the CanRen idea and scale it a lot. So um, when I talk to folks about like movie special effects or I work in the space, um, like there's a notion that like a render farm is something like 10 to 40,000 machines when working on a, on a film, okay? And we use 10,000 machines to try and minimize artist downtime. Why is programmer downtime any less valuable? Right, like especially in a space like AI safety where every extra body that we bring in to work on this thing is actually a risk because capabilities are so close to safety research. And so lots of capabilities have come out of folks who were nominally working on safety and went, oops. <laughs> so um, like trying to maximize the productivity per developer in my particular research area is rather near and dear to my heart. And so trying to figure out what is the appropriate amount of computing resources to give someone in this space so they can get ahead of the curve and like be there kind of before the rest of the industry finishes catching up. Right, like what is the appropriate burn rate to actually be efficient in this space? And I don't have, I don't have answers to all of these things. Okay. So now I'm gonna kind of poke at that, that, that was sort of the non-technical intro for the most part. So Naresh, now I'm going to actually go off the rails. <laughs> I apologize. Okay, so Kenren uses this funny search called Logic T, which was designed by Oleg. So Oleg Kiselyov is really rather well known in the Haskell community um, and in the Scheme community. He's ridiculously smart. One of the things that he did was like, when you're searching through the space of programs, prologue is gonna go depth first, like through whatever set of goals you give it. And the problem with depth first is like, if it goes in the wrong direction and there's just like X equals F of X, so it just goes F of F of F of F, and it just like keeps giving you Fs, it's never gonna stop. So the problem with a prologue style search for program synthesis is if you go in the wrong direction, you never stop and consider the other directions, okay? So, a, Breadth first strategy is one way to do this, but breadth first tends to take way too much memory. Logic T is this funny little search where the first search item kind of gets half of your attention, and then the second search item gets like half of that attention. And so you get this like geometric series worth of fall off at attention, and therefore, while you're processing things further along, like you, if, if something further in the tail is sufficiently productive, it'll pop up with an answer. But things that are at the front item is only slowed down by a constant factor. So this notion makes it so that like you have, you have the sort of same asymptotic performance as depth first search. But if the depth first search was going to diverge, instead of diverging, you only slow down by a factor of two for each time you would diverge. So this can get very, very glacially slow very fast. Um, but logic T is not depth first. Um, so it won't get lost in binaries. 
Um, but it's big and expensive. You have to keep all these environments around. So like you have a bunch of different searches that are at very different like portions of their search space. They have like maps from variables to values. Um, there's no good way to throw away old values. So you kind of leak memory over time with the CanRen approach. So like the longer you run a logic program, the slower it gets, kind of by force. Um, and this is not really compatible with like incremental SMT solvers. Like I want to use like an off-the-shelf SMT solver. So a SAT solver basically just says, hey, I'm going to give you a bunch of a big Boolean formula. Please give me an assignment of like x equals true and y equals false or something like that that in the end makes this formula true. That's what SAT solving is. Okay, and SMT solving lets you have more interesting properties than just Booleans. So if, if that's the level of SMT solving, you, you, you'll get something out of this. Um, so I want to take all that stuff and apply it here, but I can't just use an off-the-shelf external SMT solver because what's happening is most of those let you like add extra conditions. Like I'm going to add an extra like assumption, a set of like constraints on like a stack-like basis, and I can roll back on the same stack-like basis. But what's happening with the logic T style search is it's like working half of its time over here, and then it kind of gets bored and goes off and like works on something over here for a little while. Then it comes back and it works on something else for a little while. And like the 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 time that it's giving these, the, the amount of attention it's giving these things is getting smaller and smaller. And so the, all the time to set up and tear down that stack eats all of the benefit of having an external incremental SMT solver. Um, so to avoid their maps, there's this old paper. I was really, I thought it was super clever, and like I could use this. I can do use real references and support backtracking rather than having to pass around environments. And then I found this rather old paper from Cohen Clayson and Peter Lungoff, um, which had everything that I was trying to do. So I turn around and I use actual machine references, even though I have non-determinism, and I can get away with that by not doing the ADHDing around my problem domain. So I have to do something that feels more like a depth-first search. Um, and the other thing is, is that Kenren doesn't learn from its mistakes. If it goes down some blind alley and it doesn't find a solution there, it doesn't generalize that to a life lesson to keep it out of similar problems in the future. Um, in SMT solving terms, if it, um, or SAT solving terms, it does DPLL style search rather than CDCL. So it doesn't does, does do conflict-directed clause learning. When you go, like conflict directed clause learning is the idea that when you go in some direction and you don't find an answer, you have like some minimum set of variables that you like any it's anything that would cause me to say x is true and y is false would definitely blow up. So the moment I ever see x is true in the first place, I will definitely learn that y is true. Or if I ever learn that y is false, I'll definitely learn that x is false. Like it'll like it'll it'll cause me instead of ever stepping into the situation, even if I was going to do the assignments to my variables in different orders, to just never find myself in the same subset where we've already proven this goes horribly wrong. And so since Kenren doesn't do that kind of extra like reasoning, it brute forces its way through in places that it doesn't have to. And so I'm trying to avoid brute force wherever possible, to work smarter, not harder. Because even if I'm willing to spin up 10,000 machines, that's only going to give me you know, five orders of magnitude. And that's not enough as my problem space gets larger <laughs> because the blow up is exponential. Um, so the Glue that I'm using to tie all this stuff together is this idea of what's called a propagator. So uh, Jerry Sussman, who wrote the SICP book that is like the source of the logo that is sitting here for the conference, um, his last PhD, he's been chewing on this problem for like 30 years, and he finally got a PhD student to work on it with him. And that was this guy named Alexei Radul, the, the, author, the primary author on this little tech report. This is a tech report out of MIT. It was also the substance of um, Alexei's PhD thesis. So he did his thesis with Jerry. And, Jer um, and so Sussman's idea with propagators is something like, instead of having, um, I'll, I'll talk a great deal about propagators tomorrow. So if you, if you want to go deep dive on the technical portion of this, um, that's, what I'll, that's what I'll do then. Um, if, if, if someone's comfortable with all the math of it, it's like these are monotone functions between join semi-lattices. And then it turns out that I can structure problems in this way, like to push information that I, what do I know about variables and values around in such a way that it doesn't matter the scheduling algorithm that I use to push this information around. I'll yield a deterministic answer even though it's concurrent and heavily non-deterministic in the middle. 
the, the, uh, the final answer is deterministic. And so what a lot of what I've done is take Alexei's work on propagators and try and bolt laws on it. Um, because Alexei's stuff is great. It says, hey, look, here's this huge space of problems that are all propagator problems. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't ask sort of the second question of, but we've also worked on those problems for 30 years, and how do I take each one of the things that we've learned to make each one of them fast and transfer it to all the others? Like, what, what do I need to tease out the mathematical structure of what's there in order to make all the other problem domains that we have along, along this way fast? So it's like basically throwing all the problems that I've had that I wasn't smart enough to solve individually into a blender and then trying to solve them all at the same time. So that's what the propagator glue is about. Um, so what I use is like if I have intervals, um, like some kind of interval domain, where I've got, you know, x is between 1 and 5 and y is between... 1 and 5, and I have the constraint that x is less than, or equal, less, than, is less than y, then like I can establish using propagators that the, you know, x is between 1 and 4, and y is between 2 and 5 just by using that constraint. But then if I learn something about x, then I can push that information around to tell me something more about y. So I use propagators to push extra instrument information to like avoid guessing when I don't have to guess. And you can encode the traditional SAT solving problems as propagator problems and all sorts of other domains. So this turns out to subsume a huge cross-section of different kinds of solvers can be kind of encoded in, in the propagator vocabulary. And having it as a sort of common lingua franca means that what I can have is a solver that may not be the best solver at any individual sub kind of subdomain, but it can handle all of them. So you can throw data log and SAT solving and integer linear programming and all of these things and constraint logic programming and finite domain solving and all of this kind of stuff into one big umbrella and just work on the big composite problem that you have that emerges. So that's why propagators act as glue for me. The problem with the propagator network is that I put too much pressure on it like because I'm doing too much work pushing information around. Like if I say x equals y plus a constant, like, like every time I learn, like I learn exactly what x is, I learn exactly what y is. But I could do better than that. Um, so there's this notion of um, union find that pops up, or disjoint set forest that pops up in like most undergraduate computer science curriculums at some point. You'll encounter this, like it's the first time you ever see this like n alpha n bound, this like inverse Ackerman complexity bound. It's like this crazy, it grows super, super slow. Um, it's one of the things that uh, Robert Tarjan is super famous for. Um, but it turns out like what I can do is I can modify union find to allow for a group action. So instead of saying x equals y, I want to allow for like some group, some something like where it looks like the integers with addition, where we have inverses for addition, we have subtraction, right? Or with multiplication with division, we have inverses, we have reciprocals. Um, and what I want to do is I want to have some kind of group that's acting on my variables, like x equals y plus a constant, as an example. Or x equals y, or x equals not y. So I have the two element group with identity and not as the definitions, with you know its own self as its own inverse, right? Not dot not is id, and id is my identity element. Um, and if I modify the union find algorithms, which are typically like, you're allowed to um, create elements, sets, you're allowed to union two sets together, and you're allowed to ask if two elements are part of the same set. This is the thing that you can do with union find. If I modify this, instead of just saying that x equals y, or x is in the same set as y, to say that x equals some group acting on y, x equals like y plus a constant, or x equals not y, or something like that, then what I can do is reduce the, proper, uh, the pressure on the propagator network, because I don't need to just say, oh, when you learn what x is, you learn what y is. I just make them be the same thing. There is no propagator pushing the value around. It's just different perspectives on the same value. Like, just, like that's the idea of like using union find or un unification modulo a group action. So like here I've got like x equals some action of some a on y and y equals some action of b of, of b on y. That means that y is the action of like the inverse of a. Like you can use the fact that we have inverses in our group. And so if I need to like look, look at how z and x relate, we can sit there and go through either one of these paths. And so the, this is like, all we have to do is modify union find just a little bit, and you can put the, one of these group actions in it. And this drastically reduces the, the amount of pressure on the propagator network, which is the thing that lets me make all of these different domains cooperate. Um, 
So I think I mentioned briefly like integer addition, identity or not, affine transformations with unit scale turn around to pop up all over the place when I start playing with intervals. Um, and um, a couple years ago I gave a talk at Scala World on monoidal parsing. And in that talk, I used this notion of group actions in order to be able to like talk about how do I do like reparsing in the presence of small changes in a source file in sublinear time. You make small changes in the source file. I would like to rebuild the syntax tree, but I don't want to pay linear time in the total amount of source code that I have. But that means I don't even have enough time to build syntax trees that have absolute positions because building the syntax tree, the syntax tree itself is sized linear in the, <laughs> in the, in the amount of code that I've given you. So I had to come up with a whole bunch of techniques to work with that. And so everything that I was talking about earlier with group actions for, um, for this, um, everything that's in that talk turns out to be the glue for how do I take a propagator that's like listening at x, and now it needs to start listening at y, but it's now shifted. I have to shift all of those listeners in O1 time, or I kind of blow up my asymptotic complexity. So there's a bunch of stuff that's gone into this. Um, each, so basically at this point in time we're just way down in the weeds of like what are the kinds of like life lessons that I've been able to learn along the way. Um, and I apologize that this is going, this is all like the rather technical side of things. Um, there's a paper that Atsi Vanderplug wrote with Oleg, who came up earlier in the talk. Um, Atsi wrote this paper on what he called reflection without remorse, which has come up in conversation with a couple of folks here. Um, and it's how do you make monads that are efficient? Um, or how do you make um, a number of other structures that are, that are more efficient than you would expect? So there's a, a book by um, Chris Okasaki called Purely Functional Data Structures. If you're interested in learning more about like how to make functional code, like how to introduce, like if you, if you took a course on complexity theory, like, you know, like on, on amortized analysis or like uh, data structure algorithms at some point, you, you might have learned about like amortized analysis of algorithms. And when you move into the functional programming world, everything that you learned about amortized analysis is wrong because you still have the old object lying around. And so you can't do a bunch of cheap things to pay for one big expensive step in the future when I can make you do the big expensive step as many times as I want. Like I can make you rewind and go back to that previous value and like, because it's still there. Immutability has kind of destroyed our ability to reason about um, asymptotic complexity. And so um, Okasaki's book gives us a whole bunch of data structures that kind of restore that by using laziness. This is one of the reasons why I love Haskell, is that Haskell is really the only language that I can point to that's taken laziness sufficiently seriously to be able to do asymptotic analysis about code that happens to involve immutable data structures. And just wanting to have structures that are immutable is not a big ask. It's a really powerful tool as you want to distribute your data and work on multiple cores. You don't have to lock to access these things. So. Um, if you ever, if you needed a reason to consider looking at Haskell, it's really the only language I can think of that kind of like takes that idea and runs with it. Um, and so I only have a couple more of these. Um, the other things that I've been playing with is there's this whole line of research on something called natural domain SMT. So I said DPLL was sort of a dumb search strategy in the sense that it's just brute force. We just try all the, we just like, if I've got a bunch of things that X could be, let's try them all. Then let's try all the things that Y could be and continue on what X was. And we just keep going down all the branches. And we don't learn any life lessons to keep us out of like isomorphic situations. Uh, CDCL learns life lessons, but it learns it in a way that's very peculiar to SAT. It turns out that there's many domains in which you can learn those life lessons like directly in the abstract domain that you want to work with. So we can take all the things that folks know about abstract interpretation Right, which is a very different area of computer science, and apply it directly to trying to make these SMT solvers more efficient. But, well, I'm stealing all the things that make SMT solvers efficient to make logic programming more efficient. So I'm trying to take type theory through the lens of SMT solving to make type theory faster. Uh, so that's sort of the thing that's been driving me in this direction. Um, there's a bunch of other work here where I've been able to find ways to um, exploit the fact that I'm working with abstract interpretation, but I'm not using it like a computer scientist or a type theorist usually uses abstract interpretation. Um, there's all sorts of these abstract interpretation domains. We can do abstract interpretation. Um, an example of an abstract interpreter would be something like intervals. Instead of having a function that returns a number, let me have a function that gives you an interval worth of numbers. I'll just work with this as the 
um, the abstract domain that I want to I work with. Or octagons allow me to say, well, x is less than y might be a constraint, rather than having just have x and y have constraints on them independently. Now I can have these little 45 degree cuts. Or polyhedra give me the ability to make arbitrary angular cuts. Or I can work with Presburger formulas as my bounds. So instead of having polyhedra, I have like, you know, J mod four and J, like the, the, the floor of like J divided by four. So I can have like tiling and stuff like that fit into this space. Um, so I believe Siddharth might be around. I don't know if he's here yet today. Um, he's doing a session, I think, tomorrow afternoon. But he's also got a whole bunch of stuff on like using polyhedral loop optimization, which uses the latter couple of those. Um, and I really need to hire that boy. Anyways, um, <laughs> so there's a whole bunch of other, uh, other results, and they'll be on the slide. I don't think that they're readable at the scale. <laughs> um, but if you want more, um, my research agenda in this direction um, I've been exploring, uh, I sit on irc.freenode.net on the hash hash coda channel. Coda is the language project that this is all kind of nominally contributing towards. Um, the git repo for Guanxi, for the logic programming stuff that I'm exploring right now, is at github ecommit Guanxi. I have a Twitch stream. I have been very bad about Twitch streaming lately. I need to get back to it. I just moved to California and I have set up my camera, but I set it up on the wrong side of my monitor, and it's going to be, you know, a day to reconfigure my desktop, and I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm moaning and making excuses at this point. I just need to finish getting set up, and I'll be back to Twitch streaming. So if you're interested in maybe a lower density version of this kind of talk, of just like the patter while I'm actively coding things, there's probably 30 or 40 hours worth of that on, or there's way more than that actually, like they're eight hour streams and there's like 20 of them. <laughs> anyway, there's a bunch of random, many hours of me just sitting there live coding Haskell. So if you wanna get a sense of like, what it takes to climb inside of the head of somebody writing Haskell while they're doing it, like cause like, I don't know, it's like looking at a category theory diagram or something like that, the, the diagram itself is a dead thing, but the act of watching someone draw one is rather interesting or like it, it's insightful into the process. I think the same thing with Haskell. Like if you look at a Haskell library, it's like, oh my God, who would have ever thought of that? And then you watch the flailing that actually goes into implementing it, it may, may make, maybe makes you feel a little better about yourself. Um, so I do a lot of flailing on Twitch. Um, so that is the thing I wanted to talk about today. Hey look, logic programming is interesting. We can make it scale, let's do it. I'm trying to figure out all the things I need to steal out of the SMT community to make that go. Um, it's an instrumental goal for me that I want to use logic programming as a constituent part of how to build these more interesting type theories. But I think it's an important instrumental goal. And tomorrow I will dig into propagators in more detail. So that is all I have. Thank you very much. And I think we may have some time for questions. I don't know. I know. I've, I've, I left myself 15 seconds <laughs> so they can get a question in. <laughs> no. Can you hear me? Yep. Great talk. So thank you. Um, so you talked about program synthesis. So I, this is just an opinion I wanted from you. Sure. Uh, one line of thought is synthesizing programs from these complex logics like separation logic, mm -hmm. and uh, even Nadia Polikarpova has work on that where they synthesize programs from separation logic mm -hmm. and so on and so forth, where you actually do it in a language independent way since you write your specifications in a uh, higher order language, uh, higher order logic, and then you can synthesize programs from that. So mm -hmm. have you come across this and what's your opinion and how does it stand in relation to what you're uh, looking at with like type driven synthesis and things? So like I, that? I don't know that this is necessarily, these are, I don't know that these are mutually exclusive. Um, I think um, Nadia's work is basically, um, her focus on Synquid, I think they're, they're, they're like comparatively, like Canron spits out terms really, really fast, right? But it has like almost no constraints on it. And adding more and more of these constraints gets it down to a, like a reasonable scale. But I think kind of any kind of scaffolding that I can put around this, each one of these things is kind of like holding a different part of the elephant like down or I don't know, whatever the, I'm, I'm making a very bad mixed metaphor. But I just need, I need to, <laughs> Like latch, da la latch down like, okay, there's no good programs over here, stop looking, or I don't expect one. I don't expect them over here, stop looking in that direction. 
So each one of these like ways to constrain things either through like you're just directly specifying it as higher order logic or using an SMT solver and using E pattern matching or E matching in order to, to do the synthesis. All of these are like different ways to kind of view the same trick. And I'm just trying to figure out which ones are fast. Hi, uh, again, great talk. Uh, Thank you. So I would like to ask a question about uh, Karina. Uh, how is it different than Agda or Coq? Uh, how do you compare? What is Coda different or? Uh, so, the, the Guanxi, Guanxi, so Guanxi is a logic programming framework, so it's more like Prolog than Agda or Coq. Coda itself, the language, that I, the, the language project that I'm heading towards, um, is probably a talk in its own right. But it's more about how do I do, build like an extensional type theory, so it's, um, which is more like New Perl than Coq or Agda. And I, I don't, I'm not going to have enough time to answer this question in band in the session. But the, like, for, like the, 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 the much, the, for, the, for the most technical folks in the audience, it's, a, it's an extensional type theory designed to make it so that I can sort of like gradually type between something like Haskell and something like the level of Coq confidence but in such a way that all of the side goals are being emitted in a way that they can be discharged like gradually in such a way like, hey look, here's a million sub goals. Now let's take those million sub goals and farm them across the, all these machines or do like take a bunch of grad students and throw them at my problems. I don't care if my tactic is buy Mechanical Turk $20. Um, you know, <laughs> you, uh, <laughs> I just want answers to my problem or my sub goals, right? And so having the ability to try and improve like the fungibility, like the ability to convert money directly into proof, like I don't care if I do that through doing a bunch of program synthesis or I throw a bunch of grad students at my problems. Um, ha being able to throw both of them at the same subset of problems matters to me because then I can create a market. I can sit there and judge the value of proof, like in dollars rather than compute hours or something. Okay, I think, yeah. I'm, I will be around all day and for the next couple of days. So. <laughs>